there's a phenomenon that is called equilibrium population. What that means is that the population does not evolve at all. Is it possible for a population to never evolve, meaning that mutations never occur? Do our cells always work perfectly? <laughs> we already talked about that, right? No way. So evolution is always occurring. Hypothetically, if evolution were not occurring, your population would just stay the same genetically, which means the behaviors, characteristics, physiology all stays the same. All right, so in order for that to happen, for no change to occur, one is there are no mutations. There is no way that cells will always work perfectly. Mistakes happen by chance, which means that the change in characteristics in a population happens by chance. The diversity of characteristics changes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, sometimes it results in no change at all. So mutations are always going to happen. There's no gene flow. You could probably ensure that two populations never meet, separate them. I mean, there would have to be something really big that happened. We just talked about St. Patrick and L. Patrick isolation, right? The population is really, really big. Sometimes populations are small. Mating is random and everybody mates. Is everybody going to always mate? Sometimes you have characteristics in a population that are not favorable, which means you struggle to survive, which means that you probably aren't going to reproduce. And nobody's favored in the environment. No natural selection. Everybody has the same traits, so everybody is favored. Everybody's living easy. Not likely. You could probably, as a scientist, manipulate two, three, four, and five, right? You get a bunch of rats in a lab, and you can manipulate all of this, but can you manipulate their cells to all work perfectly? No. So even though all of this can happen, maybe the likelihood is it's not going to happen because of mutations. So here's two mathematicians who also studied science, they came up with proof to show that we could use math and genetics and show that what percentages are in certain genes now, come back and look at them much later, if the percentages have changed, then that shows or supports evolution has happened in that population. This is called the Hardy-Weinberg principle. We're looking at the change in the percentage of specific alleles or genes of a trait change over time. We're looking specifically at allele frequencies. The differences in a trait are the alleles. Frequency is percentage. We're gonna do that in lab today. Uh, this only works when we look at complete dominance. When you have a dominant trait, so within a gene pair, a homologous pair of chromosomes, and you look at one specific gene, it exhibits complete dominance. That means there's a dominant gene. If there's a recessive gene and a dominant gene, the dominant gene will mask the recessive gene, and the individual will exhibit the dominant trait. Even though they carry, right, there's a recessive gene here that's masked. It's there, but they mask it. There's two equations that we're going to utilize. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, and P plus Q equals 1. Ah, what does that all mean? Let's get into it. Let's think about, if we're talking about a trait, where we're going to say that the dominant allele is represented by a capital T, the recessive allele or gene is represented by a little t. P plus Q, we're looking at the allele frequencies or percentages over time. When we use this equation over here, we are looking at genotypes. A genotype is represented by the two genes you have for that trait. One gene, dominant and recessive, is the P plus Q equals one. This equation, is about the genotypes, the two alleles you have for that trait. 
So P and Q again. P squared, well, we're starting with P squared, sorry. P squared, it's the frequency or the percentage of the homozygous dominant. There's that H-O-M-O -O again, means similar or same. So when we say we have a homozygous trait, it means that you have two of the same alleles and specifically homozygous dominant means that you have two of the same, right? Homozygous, two of the same, dominant, dominant alleles, so that the genotype is capital T, capital T. That's P squared. It's a genotype. Two genes make a genotype. The phenotype, how those two alleles are expressed is they will express or show the dominant trait. They look dominant. That's P squared. <coughs> two PQ. We have two different alleles. We have a P allele and a Q allele. We ever have two of those. They're called heterozygous. Hetero means other, different. You have two different alleles. It's going to be a genotype of capital T, little t. The dominant allele is going to mask the presence of the recessive allele. They do not blend when we're talking about complete dominance. Complete dominance. The Dominant allele masks the recessive, even though recessive is there. They don't blend together. So what happens is, is the masking, the dominant allele masking the recessive makes this heterozygous individual look dominant. They look just like the capital T, capital T, but they have a different genotype. So here we have two genotypes that show the same phenotype. Two genotypes, capital T, capital T, capital T, little t, they both show the same phenotype of looking dominant. The capital T, capital T doesn't look more dominant than this. They look or express the same trait. If you are right-handed and you have a capital R, capital R, and you're right-handed, if you're a capital R, little r, you're still right-handed. Are you less right-handed? No. You're the same expression of handedness. So Q squared, homozygous again, which means we have two of the same, but this is recessive. Little t, little t, homozygous, recessive, two recessive alleles. This is the only individual that's going to have a different phenotype. They look like the recessive trait. If we're talking about handedness, two little r's makes you left-handed. P, the percentage of the dominant allele. How many big T's are in the population? We've got two big T's in homozygous dominant, one big T in homozygous recessive. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. That little T in homozygous, I'm sorry, the little T in heterozygous and the two little T's in homozygous recessive. So we look at the percentage of P squared, 2PQ, Q squared, P and Q now. We recalculate that many generations later. If we see a change in the allele and the genotype percentages or frequencies, we have proof to support that evolution has happened in that population. So let's go over an example. This is what we'll be doing in lab today. All right, we're studying the population and they show 16% recessive phenotypes. Who in the population? P squared, 2PQ, Q squared, P or Q. Which of those shows the recessive phenotype? The only one that shows the recessive phenotype is homozygous recessive. It is important to start with homozygous recessive 
because they're the only individuals that we can for sure say we know their phenotype. So handedness, if in this room, let's say two of you are left-handed and the rest of you are right-handed, could I look at you and go, uh, you're right-handed? You, you are homozygous dominant and you are heterozygous. Just by looking at you, can I tell your genetics? No. If you're left-handed, do I know your genotype? Do I absolutely know your genotype if you are left-handed? I know that left-handers have two recessive alleles. So it is important because homozygous dominant and heterozygous, they look the same, even though they have two different genotypes, because they have the same phenotype, I can't just look at those individuals who show the dominant phenotype and say what your genotype is. I can look at the recessive individuals, the individuals that express the recessive trait, and I can say, I know your genotype. So that is why we only start with homozygous recessive. Hardy Weinberg. Okay, Hardy Weinberg, the way we do this is you put the dominant allele, the recessive allele, dominant in the first row down, recessive in the second row down, dominant allele, the first row on top, recessive allele on the first row, uh, second row bottom. When we multiply these, we know we're gonna bring this allele down, this allele down, this allele across, this allele across. So that when we bring this down, and we bring this down, P and P is what we call P squared. P and Q, there's your PQ. P and Q, here's our second PQ, two PQs, right? PQ and PQ, two PQs. And then when we bring this Q down and this Q across, we have Q squared. When we're talking about 16% is the recessive phenotype, 16% represents what in the Hardy-Weinberg equation? Which one? What did we just say? Q squared. Q squared. So 16%, we move the decimal place over two places, 0.16 is Q squared. So now I know Q squared is 0.16. Now we're gonna figure out everything else because we know Q squared. If we have Q squared, we can take the square root of Q squared and get Q. Q square root of Q squared, take the square root of 0.16 and you get 0.4. So Q, And Q. All right, this is looking good. We're getting a lot of information here. Now, can we use this to figure out one of our equations? Which equation can we use this for and rearrange to figure out P? P, P squared plus Q plus Q plus Q squared or P plus Q? Okay, yeah, right? So we can take P plus Q equals one and arrange that so we say P equals one minus Q. And when we take one minus 0.4, and we get P. Wow, we are rocking and rolling through this. Let's prove our work is correct here. We know that P plus Q equal one. This is good for you to do, take a stop when you have these two and just ensure, use your calculator, boop, 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 0.4 plus 0 0.6 equals one. Okay, I'm good, I'm on the right track. 
So now, we know that. Could we take P times P and figure out P squared? What's P times P? 0.36. 0.6 times 0.6, right? 0.6 times 0.6. Point three six. Two PQ should be a breeze, right? We're going to figure out each of the individual PQs. There are two PQs. So we're going to take that point four times point six. Two PQ then will be so. What's point six times point four? Point two four. We have two PQs, so we're going to take this one and this one. So our point six and our point four. We add this PQ, one, two PQs, add them together. What's two PQ? Yeah, 0.48. So don't forget, and these, you will have Hardy Weinberg on your evolution exam. You need to understand this. As you are in lab and you're working with your group, don't be that person who's just like, la 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 la, what'd you get? Okay, cool. La la la, what'd you get? Oh, okay, cool. You need to understand this. This will be about six questions on your exam. Mm hmm yeah. Okay, so this will be your choices, right? I'm gonna put 0.36, I'll probably put 0.16, I'll put 0.24, I'll put 0.48, I'll put some random other thing. So all the things that'll go through your brain will be up there and then you're gonna go, oh crap. If you do not pay attention in lab today, So, PQ alone, 0 0.24, 0 0.48. How do we check our math on all of this? Everything outside should add up to something, and all of these inside should add up to something. What should they all add up to? One. One. Or close enough. I want you to work to three decimal places in lab. You'll get close to one. Sometimes you'll find out that you're like 0.98. You add these up and you're at 0.98. Because we're not working to like 10 decimal places, if it's close to one. But if you're more than like, if you're at like 0.90, you did some math wrong somewhere. These again, they may add up to like 1.01. That's fine. The reality is, is that nothing is going to be perfectly one. It's going to be close. Unless we work to like 100 decimal places, then we might get almost to one or right at one. Okay, so everything's gonna add up to one. Check your math periodically. Check your neighbors. Make sure if they're like, dude, that does not add up to one. Let's go back. All right, what does that have to do with evolution? Allele frequencies can change over time. Which math, I love math. We do math, if you're somebody who says, I hate math, you do math in your head probably like at least 10 times a day. We are all good at math. For some reason, in the lower grades, people say, oh, no, math is hard. <laughs> it's not hard. We use it all the time. You're good at math. Have a good attitude about math. I love math. I love it. Works for me all the time. Evolution is basically a chain and change in the allele frequencies over time. Evolution is based in mutation. Mutations cause changes in traits, causes variation in the population, causes certain traits to be favorable or not favorable, advantageous or not advantageous. A um, couple of reminders, I know, thank you for hanging in there. One is, I know today was snowy, 